My name is Henry Rollins, musician type, radio host, photographer, writer, actor, but mainly, I'm curious. I've made my way down under to drive across beautiful Australia to seek out what makes Australians tough. It's a big country, man. Yeah, I'm getting the idea. So I want to ask you, what does toughness mean to you? Toughness is about being honorable. Resilience. Fights hurt, man. Even if you win a fight. I'm going to talk to men and women from all parts of society and pull apart Australian toughness. I know all about the aggression being addictive. Oh, yeah. And ultimately, find out how it has evolved. Some of the toughness that these guys have, it can turn on them. Toughness was following through on the goals. Belief in your point of view. Being vulnerable and showing that. That, to me, is pretty tough. I'm Henry Rollins, and this is Tough Conversations. Right now, I'm heading to the Gold Coast to interview Mick Fanning. Very famously, Mick had an interaction with a shark in South Africa. If the headlines are to be believed, Mick Fanning resisted the amorous advances of the shark by punching it. The shark went away heartbroken, and they've not spoken since. First time I come to Australia, 89, I'm taken to Bondi Beach, and I wander into the water. And so I'm looking at the wave, and, oh, that's a mile back. That's, ah, bam! And it always just... And as the man will want to do, you get out, like, punched in the stomach with no air, like, I'm fine. <laughs> a three-time world champion, Mix just announced his retirement from his professional surfing career. And he's taking his retirement seriously by dedicating more time to his many business ventures, one of which is a brewery. You're in the water all the time as a surfer, and you and I both know you've had a, a well-documented shark incident that was very close. What happened? Yeah, so I was I was in the final of an event in South Africa, um, and the guy I was competing against, Julian Wilson, just caught a wave, and I was sitting up the top of the point by myself, and just as I was about to move, I heard a splash behind me, and I, I was like, in that instant, I was like, oh no. It just smacked me straight in the head with its tail. What people didn't see when the wave came up with the footage, the thing circled back. I just saw it coming back and it fully bumped me again. And that's when I was like trying to get away from it. You know, I was just screaming, freaking out. And then the last thing I saw of it was my board on top of its fin just taking off towards the horizon. It was big enough, it came up. We got stuck in my leg rope. Almost immediately, Australian newspapers mythologize you as the man who punched the shark. And the sensationalism of that built upon itself. What was that like? Um, it was tough. At first, I didn't realize how big it was. Um, got in on the beach, saw my friends, and then they were crying. I'm just like, it's all right, I'm all right, I'm all right. And it wasn't until I saw one of my good friend's wives that I crumbled. And I did fell, legs went, everything's gone. And then I got on my first plane on the way home from South Africa and the lady next to me is reading the paper and she's like, oh, look at the paper, how's the guy nearly got eaten by a shark? And I just looked over and I was just like, oh shit. And all of a sudden I just welled up and just started crying in my seat and I'm just like, shit. And um, camera crews were out the front of my house just waiting for me to do anything and I don't like the cameras, I don't like all the, the spotlight. All I want to do is just try and figure this out and try and get through these emotions. But I couldn't do that because I couldn't show my vulnerability outside my house. I couldn't just walk down the street because everyone's like, yeah, well done. Like, as you said, you, you punched a shark. And in all truthness, I was so insignificant on that day. That, that beast was, it was like, it did what it wanted to do. I was just in the way. In the story you just told me, two times you mentioned crying. Let's talk about 
Australian male culture because you're a shark puncher in it, so you are part of that history. What do you think about Australian male toughness? You know, growing, growing up, it was always, men were never allowed to show their emotions, never complain about anything. You know, if anything was hard, just suck it up right. and, you know, cry in the mirror by yourself at home. For me, toughness is being vulnerable and showing that. Um, being being at a point where you're really honest with people and, and, you know, it's scary at times being honest. I think a lot of those macho sort of guys, they're scared to look in the mirror. They're scared to answer those hard questions to themselves, you know, because in the mirror there's, there's no one else but you and if you don't want to deal with that, then those things will just keep carrying on with you. So that, that's how I see it now. To me, the real toughness is it is admitting all of that because you could have very easily just fronted. Yeah. Well, you know, <laughs> you could have really played it off yeah. in classic Aussie style. But instead you went, uh, really? It's the most terrifying day of my life. 100%, yeah. Right now, I'm in Mount Isa in far northwest Queensland. It's a mining town, and it looks like a real tough patch of real estate. I'm here to meet a tattoo artist named Mike Russo and his wife, Melissa. A tattoo studio is often like a bar or a record store. It can give you a really good sense of the town you're in. Mike? Hey, man, how you doing? Hey, good to meet you. Welcome to Hammer and Forge Tattoo. Nice. Have a look around. Hi, my name's Melissa. Hey, Melissa, nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. It's a cool place. Yeah. So what's that tower there? That stack there is the lead smelter, and so that mountain back there is um, all tailings that's been brought up and processed and dumped. That, that's not a natural hill. All of that? Yep. Wow. It sounds like a lot of people in Mount Isa, they have a tough life. Describe as best you can the life of a miner. They work, or they sleep. go home, sleep, eat, go and back to work. If you're the mom at home with the kids, where's Where's dad? Dad is a couple of kilometers under the Earth's surface. Yep. Yep. That's surreal. What does a miner get tattooed on him? The kids' names and dates of birth and... Could it be maybe uh, the guy's underground and he can... It's a reminder? He can kind of... Like you said, I yeah. think a reminder for when they are in those tough times, like, this is why I'm doing it. This wow. is why I'm here. Mm -hmm. This is why I'm hot, wet, tired underground, hungry. There's a lot of people who see a tattooed person and go, well, here comes trouble. Mm -hmm. yeah. Do you think some people get tattoos to cash in on that perception? Like, uh, to be tough, I need tattoos, or if I get tattoos, people will think I'm tough. A display. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's the same as someone who works out at the gym. Yeah, they want to show, this is my exterior. You don't know me, you know, personally, but this is how I look and I'm tough. This is what I want you to know yeah, about Yeah, yeah, yeah. Look at me, I'm tough. That's and, it. And Melissa, if you can, tell me why you get tattoos. In the beginning, it was the tattoos that meant something. I would spend hours thinking about what I wanted to get and where I wanted to get it. And they just made me feel better. And it really does turn you into a different person. And obviously, that's a very superficial thing to say. You know, like just some ink on your body it doesn't change you, but when people start looking at you differently, it does change you. It makes you harder. You have to be harder to deal with the way people look at you, the I perception think, of you. I think that's one of the reasons I wanted to get tattooed, because I knew that would come. For me, it was a confrontational thing. Like, well, you have tattoos, so I should look at you? Yeah. In fact, hold on, I need better lighting. Yeah, look at me all day, man. Because I'm not leaving. And that, that was kind of it for me, was a nervous, shy person going like, I'm really nervous and I'm shy. Ah! Just yeah. kind of coming on with it yeah. and go after everything that fills you with fear, confront it. Mm. One day I was shopping in Coles and I had this woman come. She was in her 80s and she came up to me and touched my arm and she says, look, I just wanted to tell you that if I could do it all again, I would do what you've done. Nice. She goes, I love your tattoos. And that was the biggest tie I've ever had. It was like, oh my God, this woman loves my tattoos. Well, you see the freedom in it and the, the autonomy, the self-control, like this is me, I'm making a statement. They're never coming off. Mm -hmm. So, as far as what you think toughness is, do you think it's a tattoo or do you think it's something else? 
Oh, there's guys who work in the mine and women who work in the mine who have no tattoos at all and they're tough. Especially ones who are away from their families for long periods of time. That is being strong. A tattoo's not going to make you tough. No. It might make people look at you in a different way, but toughness, I think, comes from within. The miners of Mount Isa are clearly tough, strong people, forged by the landscape around them. It's an admirable thing, but can that Australian stoic toughness sometimes be dangerous? I'm off to Castlemaine, Victoria, to visit Jeremy Forbes, who knows a few things about one of Australia's toughest professions. You want to come and get some food? Come on, tradies love food, don't be shy. Jeremy started HALT, a health promotions charity whose main focus is suicide prevention among tradies. My name's Jeremy, I'm a tradie, almost 25 years, painter and decorator, dealt with a lot of stuff, drugs, alcohol, sexism, racism in the tradie industry. Not all tradies are like that. But growing up on the big building sites in Melbourne, I experienced bullying, I experienced harassment, I wanted to suffer in silence and be strong and tough. You're a tradie, 25 years. Was there an event in your life or in someone's life around you that made you want to start HALT? Did you have some moment? It come to a head mid-2013 when I'd gone to see a guy who had a steel factory. He was a very quiet, brooding guy. We didn't have many conversations, just the way, the way he was. But we talked for like five minutes and he was the happiest I'd ever seen him. Like we had this amazing conversation. And I was just like walked away going, wow, this is something different. And yeah, three weeks later, I was painting a house in the end of his street and I heard the tragic news that he'd suicided. Mm. I went to his wake and the two words that stuck out when we were talking to the tradies was, who's next? Why do I accept this? Why do I keep losing friends and loved ones and family to this insidious thing called suicide? Why don't I talk up? Let's talk about the suicide rate among tradies. This is obviously an issue. Yes. So there's actually statistics to say roughly one every two days we, in Australia we lose a tradie. So it's out there, it's prevalent, it's almost an epidemic. And the main reasons why tradies can't keep going is um, definitely finance. Okay. If tradies go and do jobs and it might be ten, twenty, thirty thousand dollars $30,000 and they finish the job and the person goes, sorry, we can't pay you. Yeah. That sort of stuff is really difficult. Uh, and I think tradies struggle um, with relationships and the role of alcohol. And that comes back to, which I'm assuming we'll touch on, that Australian macho culture. Yeah. It's an interesting idea. You know, we're two men sitting here. You know, toughness for us, instilled uh, by our fathers and friends as young men, it's a virtue. You know, suck it up, keep going. Yeah. And when it becomes culturally instilled, it almost gets put into the DNA. And I think some of that comes with a price. I was part of that culture that did the she'll be right, you'll be right sort of attitude. Nothing like someone coming up and telling, pouring out their heart and you going, she'll be right, you'll be right. They're not right, they want to talk to you. Certainly, it takes a lot of things to build a country, but I think there's a lot to be proud of as a tradie. It's a heroic pursuit. That robust, resolute, strong tradie that can work in the elements if he needs to. I, I really value that and I respect that. But I still think, and this is part of that tweaking, which Holt believes Holt can do, is to introduce that knowledge around mental health, reduce the stigma and the taboo, and introduce that empathy and compassion and that ability to open up conversations and listen and hear and respond. Please, if you're worried, you can suggest to them, have a chat, be tough enough to actually go up and initiate the conversations. We've got a halt bag here. It's got local and national support services. Please, just put it in your, uh, in your toolbox, put it in your shed, put it in your ute, and take care of each other. Thank you so much. Thank you. We have a brekkie, so they have the rest of the day to work with their colleagues to talk about this. So the conversations will already be happening as we're talking now. Perhaps the most interesting part of what I took away from Jeremy was that 
some of the toughness that these guys have, it can turn on them. It might be tougher than their actual job to admit, I have depression problems, I have anxiety problems, because they are going against decades of, I'm tough, I don't whinge. It's incredible. But I never thought that toughness could be detrimental. Right now, I'm on my way to Maury to meet a poet whose name is Murray Harton. But to call yourself a poet kind of throws a monkey wrench into the more traditional ideas of Australian male toughness. Murray wrote a poem that went viral across rural communities yep. about the pressures faced by drought-stricken farmers called Rain From Nowhere. The dams were all but dry. Hay was 13 bucks a bale. And last month's talk of rain was just a fairy tale. His credit had run out and a chance to pay what's owed, and bad thoughts ran through his head as he drove down Gully Road. I can't feed my wife and kids. Not like Dad and those before. Crock, his grandma kept it going while Pop fought in the war. But depression now he's master. He abandoned what was right. He thought there's no place in life for failure. He'd end it all tonight. While there were still some things to do, he'd have to shoot the cattle first. Of all the jobs he'd ever done, you know, that'd be the worst. But he drove in the gate and stopped, as he always had, to check the roadside mailbox. And he found a letter from his dad. Now, his dad was not a writer. Mum did all the cards and mail. But he knew the writing from the notebooks that he kept from cattle sales. He sensed the nature of its contents. He felt the moisture in his eyes. Just the fact his dad had written was enough to make him cry. Son, I know it's bloody tough. It's a cruel and twisted game, this life upon the land when you're screaming out for rain. There's no candle in the darkness, not a single speck of light. But, mate, don't let the demon get you. You have to do what's right. I don't know what's in your head, but push the nasty thoughts away. You'll always have your family at the back end of the day. Well, he cried and laughed and shook his head and he put the truck in gear. He shut his eyes and hugged his dad in a vision that was clear. He called his wife and children, who'd lived through all his pain. Hug said more than words. He'd come back to them again. Then they spoke of silver linings and how good times always follow bad. Then he walked towards the phone and he picked it up and he rang his dad. And as his kids set up the squatter, he hugged his wife again. Then they heard the roll of thunder and they smelt the smell of rain. It's one thing to read it. It's another thing to, to hear you say it in your voice. And when I was a, a much younger person, I, I read a lot of poetry and it disabused me of this idea as poetry or poets being soft. They're word warriors. Mm. I mean, they're taking a big ideas and crunching it down and they're making it hit like like getting hit like with a, by a truck. It's, it's about what you addressed in Rain From Nowhere, the toughness, the inability to express your problems and talk about your issues. Um, as far as Australia goes, where do you think that kind of toughness comes from? Well, if you go back to, to the, um, the settling of Australia from a European point of view and then the farming, they were a long way from anywhere and the, the, nec the next door neighbour was a long way away. There was, there was you and your missus and your kids. And right. you, you couldn't go and start, you know, and cry to your mother or, or your wife. Right. And say, listen, I can't do this anymore. She said, well, you're going to have to. <laughs> right. So you just had to be tough. And right. they had to work it out. And the, the way you did it was you went and just worked harder. Yeah. Well, I reckon some of the <laughs> toughness, I'm not talking about things, comes from our huge involvement in World War One. We were only a tiny little country, but we had some of the highest casualties of any country in the world. Couldn't talk about it to people you loved because it would send them out as well. So the idea was you came home and you just buttoned up and you shut up and it was very unmanly to break down and say, well, I killed the man or whatever, whatever. If you talk about it, you're not a man. And so that's a hundred years ago now. It's, it's three or four generations ago. And a whole generation had trauma. Mm. Mm. And maybe that hard, stoic male some of that comes from the veteran who comes home and like, Dad, what was the war like? Go play with your ball, son. Because mm. a lot of men came back from World War II and they never said anything. 
I think uh, the fact that you brought up World War One and how it traumatized this country, I, I think there might be something to be said about that. This country mm -hmm. might still be emerging from uh, the effects yeah. of that. You know, these yeah. things take a long time to process. But it has changed. In the last, say, 15 years, charities come together like Beyond Blue and Black Dog Institute and the Salvation Army, and, and the communities are getting together as well to get people talking about it. There's been a, a, a major destigmatizing of, of depression, that it is a condition and it can be treated, whereas in the old days in the bush, it was like, harden up, mate, you know? Yeah. Toughen up, you know? What's wrong with you? So, the, while I didn't set out to try to write the quintessential poem about drought and depression and, and hope, um, it sort of just happened that way. Sometimes the good things just sort of come out. You know? I can't thank you guys enough for the insight, because uh, we are trying to understand uh, tough and good aspects of it and bad aspects of it. And absolutely, we learned something here tonight. I believe it was the end of 1988, first time I came to Melbourne. And the first place I stayed was in St. Kilda. Cheap food, a lot of you know, tough guys. And this is an interesting, colorful part of town. Melbourne seems to be a very cosmopolitan city where like Sydney seems to be just like a shook up can of a carbonated soda. Like where I was like, yeah, how you going, mate? How you going, mate? I was like pumped up. We're here, people are a little more cool. You know, just uh, got the pointy boots on and the sunglasses, and they're still dyeing their hair black. Right now we are in South Melbourne, and I'm on my way to interview a guy named Matt Lewis, who is a para-Olympian wheelchair rugby player about what it means to be tough and what he's overcome to be where he is right now. I had an accident about seven years ago when I was about 23. I was at a point in my life where I was really uh, delusional about where I was at. So pretty much happened because of a small homemade bomb. I was on the ground right. and when the bomb went off, it was in my hands. I'm like thankful of the way I gripped it because it took out most of my fingers, but luckily it saved my thumbs. Yeah. And that's like... That's a big deal. Hey, that's, you know, I'm I very thankful. I never thought of that. Yeah, of course. And then I'm an amputee above, above knee. So, OK, uh, so I'm getting in this. Yeah, this for a bit of wheelchair good. rugby? We'll go easy on you. Yeah, you better. Yeah, that's yeah. probably for the... <laughs> my phone, my dentures. You got life insurance? <laughs> Put a block on. There you go. Go. Go, Sandy. Yeah, that's all right. <laughs> no. Yeah. Really? Put back here. Yeah. Hands up. Oh. Can you speak to the evolution of your thinking mm. over the years? You can just do so much more than you thought you could because you, you've had to. I think rugby has definitely been part of that because it was a world, I was never in the sport before my accident, but I used to play guitar and like my fingers are messed up now, so I can't really return to that like I used to. So I thought I'm gonna step out and try something new. So you throw yourself into one of the heaviest sports I've ever seen. Mm. You and your teammates won Paralympic gold. Mm. Representing yeah. your country, Yeah, Man, yeah. that's intense. Yeah. What does toughness mean to you? I would have said when I was gone through rehab that toughness wasn't something maybe I could have harnessed for myself, but it was something I suppose I pulled from my friends and family that came in. After I got out of rehab and I started playing rugby, toughness got redefined for me as, as building, building muscle, because ultimately wheelchair rugby uh, originally was called murder ball. Um, but the sponsors don't, it didn't like it, yeah. so they had to change it, you know. <laughs> it kind of makes sense. Sure. Uh, so toughness got redefined. It was like, a, how much do I know the game? And so the very goal of getting to the Paralympics became the platform on which I propelled from. Strength and toughness was following through on my goals. And you threw yourself into it. Yeah. What was the attraction? It's a part of me that I find is sometimes quiet in nor or normal life, but on the core, I can just yell and scream, and it's like just permission to kill, you know? <laughs> it's, it's, it's what I love. It's why we do it. Which leads me to this question. Thank yeah. you. It's your fault that I'm asking it. Is any of this aggression addictive? It definitely is addictive. I know all about the aggression being addictive. Oh. It's, it is good, yeah. It's so, you know, I used to do it in music. We would be on tour, we, you know, lucky to open for some big band yeah, yeah. all day long. I'm like, 
I'm gonna kill you guys. Yeah, hell yeah. When I was watching you today, I was like, he and I are gonna get along. And it sounds yeah. like where you're at, no, yeah. not a whole lot gets in your way. It really comes back to you, yeah, yeah, how you think. It really does. You don't have to be the most able bod, like I don't have two legs, but right. I'm still able to get from A to B and still get around life, you know? Yeah. Sometimes you just gotta be more creative. I think sometimes yeah. you're just faced with some hard choices and some hard realities and you either sink or swim. And obviously, you've chosen to prosper. I'm in Victoria, on my way to Shepparton to meet a man named Adam Briggs, otherwise known as Briggs. Growing up fast, they're growing up tough, they're giving back everything they never got is a pop. And if they want something, you're giving it up. If they want something, you're giving it up. They Briggs the comedian, Briggs the rapper, Briggs the indigenous Australian. And I'm gonna be talking to him about what he defines as tough. What was it like growing up here? Because I've been to Australia a bunch of times, but mainly cities. Like, rarely do I get to parts of Australia like this. And so what was it like? Uh, I guess, like, the parallel would kind of be, like, middle America. Yeah. Being an indigenous kid growing up here, it's, like, it's a pretty racist kind of town. Fights at school. Yep. Things being said to you. Yep. Like, I remember since I was a kid dealing with um, violence and, and stuff, like, you just learn to fight. What do you think's behind that? It's a lot of ignorance. It's a lot of anger. It's a lack of education. Yeah. So where are we right now? We're at the Rumbalara Football Netball Club, and this is pretty much where I grew up. The nature of growing up is such a tight-knit community. It's like it's a whole nother level of empathy you get for the next person. You know what I mean? Like, I started the record label. I signed three acts. I want to sign more. Because I want to create a whole new expectation on what an Indigenous artist can be. Because normally they don't like us unless we're mournful and reminiscent. You know, if, if we're too busy being he, we're here and we're upset and we're angry, they want to turn us down and tell us to, to, you know, use our indoor voice. You know what I mean? It's like, you know, maybe you'd reach more people if you didn't swear. <laughs> well, let's talk about that for a second. Big guy, rugged face, a lot of tattoos. For someone who might not know you, they might go, uh-oh, here comes trouble. And I'm not looking to get mixing it up with you. <laughs> But you strike me as an as a extremely intelligent, articulate, funny, and a, a genuinely good guy. Um, do you have to deal with that younger man perception when someone sees you and you have to cut through that and go, hey, whoa, whoa, I can finish the sentence. Yeah. I actually get things done. Yeah, you know? I, I'm, I, I'm, a way, I'm way more smiley and way more polite, especially if I see someone who I can sense they're nervous. Right. Maybe you're not aggressive because you've been put upon, you've had to like fight to get through school, to get through sports as a young person in this town. I've got nothing to prove. That's it. Fights hurt, man. They, even if you win, a fight hurts. Yeah. At this point, two questions. What does toughness mean to you? And what do you admire in other people? My people walked off the Cumbergunja mission in 1939, the Cumbergunja mission is the parallel to a, a reservation. They walked off in protest with nowhere to go. That's a pretty tough thing to do. Yeah. Toughness to me is definitely resilience in the face of extreme adversity. It's about selflessness. For me, success was never about what I can get. It was about what I can get for my cousins and everyone else because What's the point of having all this good stuff if you can't share it? Yeah. Um, what are we looking at right now? That's like black flag, your band, right? Yeah. And that's like a blacker flag. Uh huh. That's our flag. And um, my and cousin made this. Oh, he, he did, did he? Yeah. And um, and so I'll be getting my check soon. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> the first lie today. <laughs> <laughs> it's banned from Etsy, he, so he, this is the only way you can get it now is from me via my cousin. <laughs> Keep, keeping it local. Keeping it local. <laughs> right.
Right now, I'm in Sydney on my way to interview Clover Moore, who's the first elected female Lord Mayor of Sydney. People have come after Clover Moore very hard. There's been some real vicious attacks and an almost constant, you know, pummeling because of what she stands up for. And I want to ask her how she deals with that. Where are we right now? So we're here in the heart of Sydney because we've got our town hall over here. And this is a beautiful Victorian building. It's in fact called the, the Queen Victoria Building. It's gorgeous. Um, we look after about a million people who come into the city each wow. day. We have um, 200,000 who actually live in the city and that's increasing. So that's a, a majority of the people are coming in and leaving. Yeah. Clover was taken on as someone who hated the car when she tried to implement safe cycle lanes in the city. These are ones I'm being pilloried. I, I opposed shooting in national parks, became a target of the shooters party, and of course, this is the Premier wanting to run me down on my cycle. <laughs> That's great. I like that you uh, are game to take opposition imagery and put it right up there, because you've triumphed over it, and it's a good fight. What drew you into politics? Well, I was living in an area that was very impoverished environmentally. I'd started a little community group. We were concerned about the parks and the through traffic. And um, I asked if they would run uh, for council. And they all said no. <laughs> so I thought I'd better do it. Wow. So I did. And that really started me on a career of, of being very much involved in the city. And so, I mean, what did you think it was going to be? And how different was it when you got in? You're a private person with your own private family life and your private career, and then when you decide you want to run for public office, you become part of the public body, and I have been an independent all of my political life, and so the environment's usually been hostile because I'm not one of them. Uh, and, and you're a woman. <laughs> particularly in the beginning, a, a woman in a very male domain. You're up against people who are shouting at you, abusing you, um, saying things about you, writing things about you, and that can be really, really hard too. When you've been attacked in the press and it veered away from the issue and became personal and vicious, how did you deal with that? I find it very hurtful. Uh, makes me angry too. <laughs> um, but there's nothing I can do about it. Uh, you know, I, I think, I think, you know, the, the Daily Telegraph, in particular, Sunday Telegraph, uh, can can be vicious, um, and I, I guess I just have to be philosophical. Um, yeah, I, I just guess it goes with the territory. I can tell that it does hurt. Yeah. The expression on your yeah. face, it it, get, it gets to you. Yeah. It would get to anybody. Do you think women have to be tougher than men? to be in politics? I think they do. Um, and as an independent woman, not only have you got, I don't know if tough is the right word, or just strong, okay. um, and, and you've got to be whiter than white. You know, you've, you've, you've got to be good, but you've got to be better. Yeah. The way you dress is picked up, the way you move, the things you do, it's all judged. You said that toughness plays into it, but it's more about strength. I don't think it's a matter of, of, of talking tough <laughs> or looking tough. <laughs> I think it's a matter of being well informed for the, the meeting you're at and having confidence and a belief in yourself and, you know, knowing that it's not about the way you dress, it's really about the person you are and, and, it's, and it's about what you're prepared to say and do. I think that is really critical. Do you think men are changing their idea of what women are capable of? <laughs> I, I think men have a long way to go before they do that naturally. Yes, I me, mean, they it, should it, be. They, you know, yeah. they see girls performing in schools and performing often much better than the boys. You know, it just seems to be a societal thing. Um, and I think it's just through sheer performance that women will be able to prove it and do it. You said something interesting when you said, I have to be twice as good. That's not the first time I have heard that sentiment expressed by African-American civil rights leaders, mm. politicians, actors, musicians. They said, I, I've got to come in early. I got to memorize the whole book because my skin color, I have to just be better. Mm. Like, I, 
it's, it's, it's the same. It's the same thing. Two prominent people have an affair, and you know, it's, it's a shocking scandal. It's the woman that pays the price, yeah. and the man just goes on and on with his life. You know? What would be your definition of tough? I think being tough is about doing the right thing. You know, a whole lot of pressures can be brought to bear on you and you can be offered and tempted and all sorts of things can happen, but knowing what the right thing to do is and doing it and, and, and having integrity at the moment of choice um, and, and you stand by your principles. I think for me, toughness is about being honourable. Right now, I'm on my way to Mooney, Queensland to visit a farmer named Dave Graham. Dave is openly gay, but I want to ask him about the toughness it took to come out in a traditional farming community. G'day, g'day. Dave, you made it. Yeah, we sure did. How was your drive? Good? It was good. It was long. Yeah, it's a big country, mate. Yeah, I'm getting the idea. <laughs> <laughs> and lots of water at the moment. Want to go somewhere dry? Yeah, please. Growing up, what was this life like? Paradise. Perfect. Did you ever feel any pressure to be like your father or his brother? Was there a box that you felt you're being shoved into as an Australian male? Certainly a guy with some size like you. Yeah, we are born into boxes, and um, I didn't fit into the box. Okay, well, let's talk about that for a second. Your orientation is not the most common, <laughs> right? And so being gay in a masculine culture where there's got to be some men who think that being gay is somehow soft, or you can't be one of the guys, there's those, these, these ancient ideas that are just utterly ridiculous. What was that like? Can you talk to your parents? Is there anyone at school? Or are you just on your own? You're on your own. So was it a secret you kept to yourself? Absolutely. That's intense. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That, that shell that uh, you put in, it's a straitjacket. So whatever I was feeling inside, you would just shut that down. There must have been some threshold where something broke. Yeah. What happened? My girlfriend and my best mate, we went off to Sydney just to have a look. Some model scout said, hey, I think you could do this. And two weeks later, I was in Europe modeling. And wow. suddenly, that strange, runty femininity that I had was my meal ticket. And uh, I got exposed to the world that I had no idea that existed. With the money I made modeling, I just spent a month traveling through Mongolia. And in that time, I met a herdsman, and, and I fell in love. What and a great story. <laughs> a Mongolian herdsman. Yeah, yeah, That's yeah, a yeah. screenplay way to yeah, yeah, yeah. But, um, but yeah, and, and we kissed, and uh, suddenly I realized that um, this, is, this you, is who I am. You arrived. Yeah, so I ended up back on the farm um, as a new person. But that new realization of this is who I am came smashing into the myth that was still existing because nothing had changed. What's it like going up against that? I was a stranger in my own country and my family didn't know who I was. So what was the, the fallout from that? Well, I tried to kill myself. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I was totaled my ute and... Um... Well, well, tell me about this. I'm not trying to be morbid. <laughs> yeah. But at one point, you tried to end your life. Yeah. What got you to that point? There was two options. One was to be a, a farmer or go to the city and be a, a Mardi Gras Right, fag, because you, you, know? you can't be gay in the country. That's Absolutely a city not. person Absolutely thing. not. And obviously, thankfully, didn't work. Totally smashed my ute. Yeah, totally but, ruined it. Yeah, oh. but, but you... I love that ute. Thankfully, you survived. Yeah. Did that bring any new thinking? It did. Yeah, I ended up going on a reality TV show and I revealed to my housemates and, of course, the rest of the country who I was and um, it just gave me pure and absolute freedom. However, in a normal situation, if I was to go speed dating, I'll be going speed dating when there's boys on one side and boys on the other side. Oh, you <laughs> All right. Most people do not have to go through so much hell just to be who they are. And the fact that maybe something that you have done 
has brought Australians closer together. I would never have expected that our country from 2006 to uh, 2018, the whole population went out and voted and said, you know what, you're okay. And that's, for me, is tough. That's the whole country saying, we believe this, we grew up with this, this is what we were told, but it wasn't true. The corridors of Parliament flooded after laws passed to allow all couples to marry. When the vote happened, I watched it live on TV and I bawled my eyes out. Yeah. And my little nephew was like, oh, why is Uncle Dave crying? And, um, and I just said to him, it's because we're all free now. Yep. And uh, I hope that the future is as different a country we're in now as the past is that I experienced. I've just come away from my conversation with Dave. And all I can say is, wow, the most profound part of the whole interview was when Dave told his story, he was also telling the, uh, the story of Australia in this century. Along the road, I've learned a lot about Australian toughness. Australia is one tough country. Toughness is an obligation to being Australian. From the strength and vulnerability of Mick Fanning, to the power struggle of Clover Moore, and the gritty yet inspirational story of Adam Briggs, I've learned that often Australian toughness can be damaging, but often it can be powerfully strong. But mostly, I learned that toughness has evolved from the cliche it was in the past. That Australian toughness isn't about physical strength or controlling your emotions. Toughness isn't a veneer or an armor, but more an ability to bend with the wind and always bounce back.